Alrighty. Hey, gang. Welcome back. Episode 5, Zero Carb Journal. So, well, let's see, you guys. Today, I'm a little scattered, actually. I um, had a great morning meeting some new folks uh, down at the big house, hoping to be new tenants, and I talked a lot, so... I may have talked myself out, but I did want to get a new one up. You know, I was hoping today that I was going to do some lifestyle. I was thinking I'd take you guys for a walk around the property and show you kind of what my, one of my days might look like around here. Although um, in the winter, they're a little uh, <laughs> weather dependent <laughs> pretty regularly. And uh, with that said, as you can see out there, um, it is a misty, foggy day, so I thought I'd hold off on that one because you really can't see much out there at all. As you can see, my my tree is in the fog, and it's not very far away from me. So, um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit. You know, a lot of folks have been. Uh, I've gotten a couple comments, anyways, about wanting me to talk about relationships and work, um, and how uh, I think I think the questions are how my illness affected those um, and maybe also how I deal with those on zero carb and uh, I will I, I'll, I'll go over that I think today and talk a little bit about that um, so I'll just give you an update as well as far as me I think that's gonna be um, probably what I do from here on out is talk about how I'm progressing with the diet I wanted to get us all caught up on my history um, and share all that with you but I also want to share my continuing path and what I've been finding so um, you know I'm still eating mostly my ground beef burgers now I've had quite a few comments of you know people asking I did talk about how what I ate um, and I guess they're still a little I, maybe I wasn't totally clear on how I cook it and all that so I'll just cover that a little bit again is is that you know I've found that I really um, do better with a much lower fat content than than what's normally recommended and I keep experimenting with that and it, it does hold true for me so this is not me speculating not me trying to work the protein leverage hypothesis or any of those things I'm just listening to my body and finding what works best for me and in my case, it's um, relatively low fat compared to other people. So, you know, I make hamburgers. I make them tiny, you guys. I mean, they're uh, when they're fresh, they're like that big, really, like two to three inches across and flat, um, quarter inch or less. And I grill the crap out of them. I, I burn them. I'm not going to lie. They, I like them black. <laughs> I'm afraid to show them to you guys. I, I don't want to show any pictures or put them uh, up because... <clears throat> they look awful. I don't think anyone really likes their food that way except for me. <laughs> and uh, I'm okay with that. I, I've come to recognize that uh, I keep, you know, and, and when I was learning about this, I kept being like, oh, you're doing it wrong, Matt. You did try it normal. And uh, I just really don't care for the flavor of the beef very much unless it's got some char on it. Now, talk about health and all that with burn stuff you know there's the risk of the advanced glycation end products and people always talk about the components of cook or the products of cooking and overcooking are the harmful parts um, but frankly I'm not worried about that I think people have been cooking food and fire forever um, that isn't an argument for it being healthy I just think that we do and uh, <clears throat> the studies that I've read and the research I've done on the advanced glycation end products, which seems to be the big bugaboo that people mostly worry about when they talk about carcinogens from overcooking and things like that, uh, those are present at at exponentially greater levels in plant-based cooking and plant-based foods. So um, again, I'm not the scientist. I don't want to go try and go into any details because I'm going to get them all wrong. And that isn't to say that, you know, I'm not um, that isn't to say that the meat might not be better for me if it was less cooked or something like that but uh, but I cook the crap out of them and they're pretty much burned and dry <laughs> and that's how I like it so a pound of meat turns into about eight ounces of little thin little I call them a uh, meat cookies they're just like it's like a bowl full of little tiny little um, cookies <laughs> of, of beef and uh, I like them that way so I, I went down to my family place my folks place this summer and visited and I was excited to um, share some of my food with my dad who's you know big into barbecuing and stuff and he was just like ugh tastes like overcooked dry burgers 
<laughs> so that's what I eat and it does render a lot of the fat out when I plug that into chronometer I, I use one of their um, pre you know um, their presets there for uh, 80 20 ground beef cooked drained and rinsed and that comes out at about 40 percent fat by calories or 40% calorie. Yeah, 40% of your calories from fat and 60% from protein somewhere in that range. So that's about what I think I'm eating. It's way off the recommendations, but I feel so much better eating like that than I do if I raise the fat. So I'm sticking with it. Um, so that's what I've been eating mostly. Now I have been occasionally experimenting with some uncured bacon. I had some yesterday. Seems to be fine. I had some bacon a while ago that was normal cured and I felt like it really drove me into inflammation. Not instantly, but when I ate it a few days in a row or over the course of a week, a few days, um, the next week I would start sort of bloating. So I'm not sure about that, but I've been playing with it a little bit and I'm back on to some fish so bacon seems to the uncured bacon seems to be okay for me I sure do enjoy it I don't eat it much because I think I'll um, I don't know just eat a lot of it I guess and and again it's kind of higher fat so I don't think I do real well on it I do notice some tummy grumbling and stuff after I eat it um, I tried some sheep's cheese I might have mentioned that already I tried that a few weeks ago uh, I at the time I was eating that I was also experimenting with the uncured bacon and you know, I had a one night that wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. I, I was, went back to kind of some stomach pain and a lot of noises and stuff. So I'm going to leave the cheese alone for now. That was the only experiment with cheese I've done in this last year. I haven't tried any cow dairy. Um, I really believe I have a problem with that. So I'll probably experiment a little bit. But, you know, someone else just asked me that, I think, on Reddit. And, and my answer was, you know, I really, I'm not craving any variety. And I think I've said this every time I consider adding something I'm like why would I do that I just feel so good and I so much enjoy my meat cookies as odd as that sounds um, why mess with a good thing so I'm not um, motivated for variety uh, and I don't crave anything else I'm curious that's the only reason I would try things uh, but I feel great and and like I've mentioned many times the cravings are gone for any carb foods or even any variety I just really don't want anything else so why bother so that's what I'm eating. I'm eating uh, mostly my meat cookies, hamburger. I'm eating about two pounds a day. I'm uh, eating some salmon along with that. You know, yesterday I had probably about eight ounces of smoked salmon and been eating that probably every other day. Um, my little dog wants to be under me making noises. Well, will you go somewhere else, please? Thanks, bud. Good boy. So, um, yeah, fish. Beef, playing with bacon a little bit, drinking water, and that's it. So let's um, let's do a little bit of work in relationships. Um, I'll give you some of my history just to give you the background. You know, I, I've talked about it a little bit. I uh, boy, a lot of this again goes back to I think being ill and not knowing it. Um, but I grew up, you know, when I was in high school, I had a variety of jobs bus boy, ice cream store, and then my long time job through my teenage years and even into uh, my early college years um, in summers was maintenance uh, at a private club in my town. So we, I would do the pool, chemicals, and we were on the lake. There was people would moor their boats there. So I'd do dock maintenance and mow the lawns and you know everything and then in when I would work there year-round we would in the winters we would do painting and roofs and clean the tennis courts and um, I learned a lot and I found that I really enjoyed working with my hands and I really uh, you know I liked all the challenges and I liked making building things we built a lot of play sets for the kids and terraces and landscaping I love landscape and love plants got I became very passionate about um, that aspect of things growing and um, I think that's a big part of how I ended up in getting into farming and stuff. Um, so I did that uh, for quite a few years, but as I mentioned, I was really a passionate um, action sports guy. It was the 80s, and I was um, into snowboarding when no one else was. You know, you never even saw anyone doing it. We weren't allowed to go on the resorts, and so I started, you know, getting involved in that community. At a, at a young age and, and when it was very young and, and that led to a lot of opportunities for me so um, as I when I graduated high school I went to college in Colorado I moved out to 
Gunnison, Colorado, just uh, south of Crested Butte, and that was a complete fiasco. I was there mainly to snowboard, and I've talked about needing to be in the cold, jumping in the water early in the morning, or I didn't feel good and my bowels would be loose. And I remember one of my most profound experiences there in college, and I didn't tie this into my gut health for a long time until real recently, but I remember it um, like it was yesterday that there was one class, I think it was history, I guess I don't remember like it was yesterday, um, but that teacher graded on two things, attendance and tests. And the tests and his lectures in class, they were straight out of the book, um, and I was, you know, independent and... 18 and and um, had diarrhea and wanted to snowboard <laughs> and so my attendance was awful um, I went for the you know for a while and realized all his lectures were right out of the book and I've always been good at, at reading and, and comprehension and retention and so after a while I started mostly showing up on test days now a lot of those days this is the part I remember profoundly is leaving my dorm after having gone to the bathroom a couple times and going across campus and getting there and having to use the restroom again um and show you know going into class like a few minutes a few minutes late because i was stuck in the bathroom and boy he really didn't care for me he was an ex-military guy and i was pretty loose and undisciplined and um he thought that history was going to be about discipline i guess and i was pretty adamant to prove that it wasn't so of course they post the test scores on the wall on the door at the end of the of the week or whatever and I was at number one in the class all the way through and so I said well I'll just get a C <laughs> get an F on attendance and an A on tests and I'll come out right in the middle and that's fine and you know we got to the end of class and he called me and he said he was going to fail me and so I didn't even finish that semester that was my second semester of college I just got in my car and drove away because I was so upset uh, that I was paying for an education and it still had those same stupid rules as high school so for better for worse um, I think it was for the better to be honest I had a great run there for a long time um, and I don't think I was ready to stick with school so this is tying back into my work um, because that really set the stage, right? So I, I came back to the Northwest and I continued to follow my passions in snowboarding. I moved to Bellingham and started going to Mount Baker, um, bought my season pass at Mount Baker and I got a job in a ski shop. And working with my hands, I continued to do. I continued to tune skis and teach the local uh, ski race team for the college. I, I taught them how to tune and took care of all their skis. And at the same time, I learned sales on the sales floor, and I found I was good at it. You know, my father was always sales, um, insurance salesman, and, and I did really well, and I found it very easy. Um, like I mentioned before, it would kind of suck the life out of me, and I would go hide in my room when I was done and, and introvert out, but, uh, but I could put on my mask, as I've always called it, and um, be very open, and I did well with that. So... Um, that was a great year for me. This is, we're now in 1989 and 90, and I, I won a really prestigious event of a Mount Baker, the Mount Baker Bank Slalom in 1990, uh, and that really kicked things off for me, and I was off and running. I was a sponsored snowboarder. I was going on tour and, and in magazines and national, um, in the running for national champ. Uh, I was actually at the top of the, of the stats. I would compete, traveling around with my good friends who are all now um, snowboard famous and, and all that. But uh, but I took a different path. You know, I, I wasn't as good as they were. I was good, but I was riding with the best in the world, and so I could see the difference. And so around the time, let's see, I'm still working at the store there, and I got asked to do some repping, uh, sub-repping, working with some of the sales reps, and I would went down to Mount Hood for the summers, and we were digging half pipes back before they had half pipe machines. <clears throat> and uh, my, my friends who were better were training, teaching kids, they were coaches, and I was running demo vans and working as a rep and, and, and helping out um, the reps with, with those kind of activities. And that really kind of led me into what was my career for a long time. Uh, I moved back to Seattle and started working at our local snowboard factory, um, and they quickly 
well, they didn't do anything. They just didn't use to answer the phone <laughs> because they were they had too many orders. So I started answering the phone, and before too long, I found myself um, in sales, which, you know, I, I never wanted to do that. I wanted to build stuff and make stuff. Actually, one of the reasons they hired me was because I had designed some wakeboards and built them with fiberglass, and um, I was just always creating things. And that was, I think, what I really wanted to do, but I didn't recognize it, and I didn't follow my heart. I mean, I did. I was following my passions of snowboarding, but I got roped into sales, and it was exciting. You know, I was 21. It was a burgeoning industry, and I was making a lot of money for 21. I bought a brand new Dodge truck in like 1993 with cash and I was on top of the world and I was traveling the country so um, so I started being a sales rep for our local uh, snowboard manufacturer and they sent me back to Colorado and I spent years doing the Rocky Mountain loop I was still competing um, I was still in magazines somewhat but I was really transitioning more into a sales role and supporting our sponsored riders and things like that so <clears throat> Excuse me. My work history for that first, you know, decade and more of my working life is really one of of putting on that mask of being a real outgoing person and going to every snowboard shop in the in the my region, which was Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and a couple of the Great Plains, Nebraska, um, and Kansas, I think and going out there and being everyone's best friend for two hours in the shop and then maybe going to an event that night and and continuing that but most of it was on my own driving in a in my truck put a camper on the back loaded it with snowboards and i was alone and you know i functioned better that way um and I really feel like I talked about this a little bit when I was first starting working in the snowboard factory in the city I was driving commuting into the city and I couldn't make it my bowels were too loose and I was in pain um, and the traffic you know I couldn't go 20 minutes but from one place to another to get to work so I wasn't really able to do that I think that really kicked off a lot of this nomadic lifestyle where I could be on my own in my camper and so I spent you know up until I was 32 I was on the road 300 320 days a year. I was in a camper. Um, I could, you know, use the bathroom whenever I wanted. And and I did often. <laughs> um, but I think that's a really big part of, of my work history is, is needing to be on my own schedule, needing to be able to break away and have private time. And, you know, like I mentioned before, my journals, you know, I was depressed. I would, I would, be real outgoing and then I would really pull back into my shell and hide and that was a pattern my whole life so we're gonna talk about relationships too and and um, I'll do that you know it during that time somewhere along 95 or so I met a wonderful woman we were both in our mid 20s young 20s and um, she was great and I talked about this a bit she didn't eat any fat and we were really you know vegetarians for the she was vegetarian I was for the most part and then eventually was um, and I don't think those things helped any of our health or mental attitude you know whatever and we got along well but I was um, on the road and I was non-committal <clears throat> all my life I knew there was something wrong I didn't ever consciously recognize it but I knew I wasn't ready to be someone's partner because I had some work to do. And, and now I look back and I'm like, right, I was, you know, having terrible diarrhea and pain. And I was hiding from that, from people because of that. And I was depressed. And I didn't understand why I wasn't ready to commit. But I was just really felt like I wasn't ready to be somebody's partner. And at the same time, I always was kind of family oriented I think I really I when I was working in my first uh, long-term job that I talked about at that club there was lots of kids running around and I just I was great with kids I, I always have loved them and I always thought I wanted them and that first girlfriend always said she didn't ever want kids and so as we got to be about 30 and I started to have the means to purchase a place and I was starting to think about where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do in the future, you know, I, we started to have those conversations and I wanted a family. Um, and so, and there was other issues too, but, but that was probably the root of it. We, we were pretty compatible. 
Um, and so I let her go and, uh, and it was the right thing to do, but you know, she moved away and instantly got pregnant <laughs> and, uh, I won't go into her story, but, um, you know, that hurt me. And so at any rate, it, it did help me recognize what I wanted out of a relationship, but I also recognized I wasn't really ready for one. So then a few years went by and I moved up here to my little town and I started, I, I, I quit the snowboard world at 32 or 34, somewhere in there. There was some transitional stages there where people, you know, what happened was I was, had been a sales rep for a long time and the industry had been young and I was a pretty well established player in that industry. Um, I was making great money. I was a rep for Quicksilver and O'Neill and, and uh, some major brands. And I was starting to be offered sales manager jobs and I saw the writing on the wall. You know, I knew I wasn't interested in being a salesperson my whole life. And those sales manager jobs, the action sports industry is all in Orange County, California, for the most part. It was at the time. And uh, life at trade shows in Las Vegas and, you know, drinking and, and being everyone's buddy. Um, I knew that wasn't for me. And I think part of that might have been my depression and might have been my illness. And I think part of it was becoming more aware of who I am, knowing I wanted to create things and build things. And, uh, and that as much as I love snowboarding and surfing, I was probably looking for new challenges at this point as well. So, yeah, so I moved up here and then I started looking for other work. And again, um, I was limited. I didn't feel like I could go get a nine to five. Now I'm starting to be stuck to the toilet quite a bit, but I still don't really recognize it as a huge problem. I wake up in the morning and I don't eat until two or three because that kicks off. You know, I would have diarrhea a few times in the morning and I could tighten it up. But if I ate, I would be sick again. If I went to lunch, I would usually just, it would come right back out within 20 minutes, diarrhea, and maybe spend a lot of time on the toilet. I didn't, it's so odd that I didn't recognize it as a problem, isn't it? But I didn't. I, it was how I'd always lived, even when I was very young. I never thought of it as being sick. I just thought it was how it was. Um, but because of that, I wasn't, I never felt like I could function in a nine to five. And I don't think I really even connected those pieces. I just said, oh, I'm not cut out for that. Now I really understand more about why that might have been. So um, at that time, I met uh, the woman who I, you know, I really fell in love with and, and, uh, and she had some great connections and she helped me get work down in our local boatyard and it was miserable. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was grinding the paint, you know, awful copper toxic paint off the bottoms of boats and painting them, but I was always fit and a go-getter and, uh, um, and yeah, so I worked in that boatyard for many years doing horrible things with toxic chemicals. I'm sure that didn't help my health either. But along the way, I learned a lot and I made some great connections. And our town here has a real good boat building industry. And my, some of my skills, you know, I, I've talked about work and, and a little bit, but I've worn a lot of hats. And all through those years, I was playing music and I was recording music and I was starting to record bands and make records and um, playing in bands and touring. And I had a good underlying understanding of electronics, especially low voltage electronics. And so I rolled that into that boat work and I became a marine electrician and eventually learned how to do marine electrical design. Um, and so really the history of my work is one of, of staying on my feet and staying flexible um, and finding things to do that made me valuable to the people around me that other people couldn't do. And a lot of that, that wiring stuff started because I was so small. They would stuff me into those little holes and boats and I would carry heavy batteries way up into some little tight spot and wire it. And uh, so, you know, I had skills that were marketable and I had an attitude that was ready to go and it didn't matter that I had diarrhea. I could, I could go to the bathroom a bunch of times in the morning and work in the boatyard at my own pace. Um, so that's part of my work history. Along the way, I picked up my captain's license and I did some work as a delivery captain. Um, I have a 50 ton master's license. I let it lapse in the last few years because I didn't want that much responsibility any longer, but I had some great trips up to Alaska and things like that. I did some commercial fishing. 
Um, again, through my boat connections, I found a great guy who needed a help who needed help on his boat, and so I spent a few um, seasons long lining in in Alaska and and got great experience there, and that actually led to me getting my captain's license. Um, and I've worn a bunch of other hats as well, but but those are kind of the main things that I did for other people and and got me you know to my work history is one of of a lot of irons in the fire um, and not firm time commitments and that's real important so um excuse me and that brings me back to relationships because I got that job originally through um, the woman I really fell madly in love with and she was younger than I was and I think we were very compatible we're, we're still very close and but we were at different stages in our life and um, you know she hurt me very badly and so a lot of my 30s I spent kind of mourning that and not very capable of dealing with it now I think I'm getting at this point very sick and really depressed and so I you know, I've talked to her many times in the past about it. I don't blame her for any of that. Um, I think our history, our relationship was a trigger for me to, to be that depressed and to sink down into that hole. And I spent a lot of time there. And so through my 30s and even into my early 40s, I was frankly unavailable to anybody. And I was depressed um, I was still sick and getting sicker and so I still was feeling like I could never commit and, and be someone's partner and at the same time I'm um, um, you know hating on myself and and hurt from my last relationship and I, I it took me a long time to get over that hump during that time um, I had a one wonderful woman who um, came into my life and I told her right from the get-go that I was unavailable and she stuck it out for three years or more with very good communication we were always very clear you know I was always like I I don't know what I'm doing I feel I don't have a future I didn't like myself um, so I never let her on and and she kept saying that's okay for me for now and then finally she got sick of it and rightly so and and we had it was great we communicated well and and, uh, and we split up I let her go and she moved on and and that was that so that was four almost five years ago now um, that's Pearl my great Pyrenees out there barking we're probably gonna get to listen to her for a little while <laughs> so um, and so that combined with one more event was really the catalyst for me getting to where I am now because you know I let her go and then I moped around for a few more years and I was still kind of hung up on the other one from the from when I was 30 even though it had been 10 years at this point and she had clear made it clear that she had chosen somebody else over me she um, you know had moved on obviously had never been there for me for the most part and I had some really good things happen in my life. At that point, I'm starting to build these stoves, which I which I design now and build. Um, I don't build very many. I, I sell plans for these cook stoves and super efficient wood stoves. That was a, something I became interested in when my money was tight and I needed to heat my house. And so I learned how to build very, very highly efficient wood stoves. And I started to share that technology. I started to teach workshops that hippie communes and things like that and it's become a real um, foundation of my livelihood and something I really am passionate about because I think it's going to change the world for the better um, in the long run although it's going to take a lot of convincing to get there but anyways along the way I was chosen I was really honored I was chosen for um, a competition in Washington DC I was chosen by popular mechanics and um, a lobbying group in in DC for clean air and, and clean energy and um, and I, I drove out to Washington DC in 2013 and brought one of my wood stoves and I competed on the National Mall we set up all our wood stoves and I was competing against the biggest wood stove manufacturers in the country I was competing against Woodstock Soapstone and Lopi and Blaze King. I don't think they were there actually, but um, Tuakivi from Finland, the the masonry heater maker, and Lars Hellsbro from Finland, and um, 
Richard Drusel from Austria, and so, you know, just some of the greatest heater builders in the world, and, and somehow there I was, and I didn't have much experience, um, but I had some pretty cool technology. And that was really exciting for me. So I drove out there, and, and along the way, that first love of my life started calling me again. Um, and, I'll, you know, I, I had a two-week trip across the country. I went to Nashville. Gosh, I loved Tennessee. Um, you know, that was probably the one place I, could, I think I could live other than the Northwest. The Smoky Mountains were amazing. I just had a great trip. It was awesome. I, I had never really gotten to travel. I'd never been to the East Coast. I was 40. That's not true. I had gone to build a stove in a restaurant in Brooklyn um, for a friend, but for the most part, I'd never traveled the East Coast. And I just loved it. I had a great time. And along the way, she's calling me and making noises like, you know, maybe this is it. We're finally gonna, she's grown up and we're and ready to do it. And, and, uh, you know, it was true love and we were going to come back together and make it all work out. And so I, I cut my trip kind of short and I raced home and that was the last I heard of from her. And man, that was it. You know, at that point I was like, wow, I have been waiting and keeping myself single and, and not able to commit. And at that, then I recognized how what a wonderful opportunity I'd had with my most recent relationship and what a great partner she would have been. She was wonderful and she really loved me and she was really good to me. Um, and I just looked back and went, geez, I have been depressed and I am sick and I'm going to, and, and I just, these last 10 years, I just have been, you know, continually sort of holding out for this fantasy that didn't exist. Um, so that was it. I, th you know, I told you I hated myself and that was pretty much why. <laughs> Uh, at that point, it was really bad, and I really didn't like myself. It's like 2014 now, and so that was when, like I said, I started jumping around. And by that, I mean I, I said, I'm going to get fit. I'm going to, you know, trash the old me, and I'm going to become someone new who's positive and looking forward to um, every day of progress and growth and um, becoming the person I really want to be. And so I started, I didn't know, you know, I'd always been sporty and stuff, but I really didn't know anything about fitness or health. I thought I did come to find out I didn't. Um, and so I started, I say jumping around and I did, I, I got an app and I was doing like circuit, you know, mountain climbers and jumping jacks. And, and I did that for a while and I lost my belly fat and I started counting calories like I talked about. Um, and Along the way, you know, I started to fix my diet and, and we talked about the depression and all that and I started to come out of the fog. I started to like myself and I started to train myself to love myself and I also, my brain changed. I, I started to become well and so I'm now capable of loving myself and I've learned a lot about fitness and I might do some, cover some of the things that I do now that have really worked for me. Um, I'm 48 and I'm in the best shape of my life, honestly. Um, a lot of that's the diet, but I've been working hard at it as well. And so that got me to the point where I think, you know, in terms of relationships, I finally am ready. And uh, so that's been this last year. And I guess I'm going to just finish this out with being really honest, is that uh, my last relationship four years ago with the person who really would have been an excellent partner who really cared for me you know we stayed friends um, she had moved to Seattle and uh, and I texted her this year on her birthday which is in September early September so just a few months ago and I said hey happy birthday and she said oh I moved back to town to my little town I'm going to school here and she at this point now has a small daughter two and a half year old daughter and I said wow well let me take you out to lunch and let's meet and so we um, went out for a month here in September and October and, and talked deeply and we didn't get romantically involved, but I talked about what I wanted and, 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 you know, what I'd always wanted and how I was, you know, finally capable of being the person I wasn't before and, and how much I regretted letting her go. 
and she was all in and we were it was pretty exciting i spent like three weeks <laughs> doing um making plans and starting to get romantically involved and i i did i called her dad and i asked her to marry me and she said yes and we planned a family and then a week later she called it off and wasn't really able to say why and and uh You know, I have reasons. I I understand why. I won't go into her story either. Um, but she did the right thing, and I have a lot of respect for her because it must have been really, really difficult to come to that realization. We were on open book, totally clear that we were both all in and loving where we were headed and making plans. And she realized that there was some underlying stuff that she had to deal with, just like I had to before the tables had turned. Um, she wasn't able to articulate that, but that's okay. Uh, so in October, that was Halloween about when we went trick or treating and, and then she dumped me <laughs> and, uh, that was hard for me. That was really hurtful. Um, but you know, it was good because what it did was it made me really recognize that, wow, yeah, I am really ready. And I do really want, have always wanted those things. And I'm pretty old and I live in a small town. And uh, my singles profile reads like uh, everything no one would want. <laughs> um, but despite that, I'm optimistic. And uh, more than anything, I just know myself better than I ever had. So you asked me to talk about relationships. Boy, I hope you're ready for the <laughs> full meal deal. Because that's sort of the romantic relationships deal. I have had a long journey of being... I would say incapable of a deep committed relationship. And I would say that that is in a large part. I always thought it was me, but I don't think so anymore. I think I was sick and I think I pushed people away. And when I look at, you know, Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis and any really autoimmune symptoms, often depression is a part of that. And what you'll find is that those people are more often than not alone and push people away. And so... It was a great, it was great to learn that, excuse me. It was really good for me to learn that because now I recognize that I'm not a monster <laughs> and uh, I am capable of forming committed relationships and I do, I have always wanted those more normal things, but I just wasn't there. So that's romantic relationships, family relationships. I'll talk about that a little bit because now we're just going to talk about zero carb specifically in relationships because there's some challenges there. It's, it's isolating. Um, in, in a lot of ways. And boy, when you start, it is very difficult. You know, you feel like you can't talk to anybody. Um, I felt personally like the, you know, the, the dichotomy between what we'd been told about what was healthy and, and what I was finding was actually healthy for me was so profound that, that that gap could never be crossed and I was just I was agitated and I was combatant and uh, you know I was so um, uh, what's the word I mean enthusiastic isn't it I was I was I was um, obsessively fundamentalist or whatever in my original grasp of, of zero carb and and so it was hard for my brother and sister, you know, 30 year vegetarians and more. And, and, uh, and my family eats, you know, oh, low fat cheese and all that bad advice we've been given forever. And so I couldn't keep my mouth shut. You know, I just wasn't jerk to be around. Um, and they were all very <laughs> loving and understanding, thankfully. Um, and when I was starting to see the, you know, my, the woman again, you know, I was, I was, I was rough to hang out with. I don't blame her. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't eat that. That's awful. Seed oils. Oh, my God, you're dead tomorrow. And, of course, none of that's true. But, uh, but you know, I was a jerk. And, I, and um, not really. I was trying to be understanding. But I was just very, very caught up in, in all, everything I'd been learning. And um, so from a relationship standpoint, zero carb can be tough in the early days. I'm not the best person to talk to you guys about relationships. Because, honestly, I don't really have many right now. I live here and I don't really see other people much at all. Now I took some pain work, so I'm going to go next week and I'll be, uh, 
hanging out with a lot more folks again. But uh, for the most part, for the last few years, I have been, you know, no human contact for weeks on end, honestly, except for you folks online. So I'm not the best person to talk about relationships, but I will say that zero carb in the beginning is hard because you sort of have to reject everything we know as right in terms of nutrition and health, right? You know, um, and so, and you have to embrace it. Um, for the most part, I found myself being, you know, sort of overwhelmed by, by belief in, in this way of, of eating. And with that comes rejecting of the way everyone else is eating and not that you have to poop on them. And, and I'm getting much better at that now, but, um, it's tough at first to reconcile those things. So over time, you know, that gets easier. Like I said, it's kind of like the carbs stop being interesting and, and the lack of variety actually starts to be, um, you know, it seems less restrictive. And, and in a lot of ways, the relationships thing seems that way too. You know, I'm, I'm more stable now. I'm not depressed. I don't have mood swings. I'm much more in tune with myself and what I really want. So I'm actually in a much better place to be good to my family and be good to the people that, that are in my life. And I've been working actively at that. Um, so I'm no longer like the zero carb zealot. That's the word I was looking for, zealot. Um, you know, I'm no longer feel the need to preach to my folks because I just learned this thing about, you know, linoleic acid or, you know, whatever. Um, the latest thing I was been reading is, and um, I'm no longer, I'm an internal zealot, but I don't need to be externally uh, expressing that to the people I love um, at the risk of harming our relationships. Do they have a problem with it? Kind of. Um, you know, I know my sister, she's a real um, science-based person. She works in, in STEM. Um, and has a couple master's degrees and is, you know, and my brother as well, same kind of person. And uh, so, yeah, you know, I get some comments, but not offhand or off the cuff, you know, just genuine curiosity. And um, and that's been fun. That's been OK, working those things, working through those things with them. So, you know, relationships are tough, but I think they get better over time and because we get better over time. And, and the diet for me has been a profound improvement in my whole overall being so I'm able to communicate and understand and be more compassionate and be more positive and that's one of the biggest things you know is this whole journey has been one of seeking to be positive and be in the moment and appreciate what I have because when I was sick it was pretty obvious um, how fortunate I am when that I if I can get up and do some exercise or go outside or go to work or just be here and look outside that I'm fortunate so yeah, so those things all lend themselves to really, um, my relationships in the last year are a bit, have grown so much stronger. My relationship with my family, finally spending time with them when I never used to be able to. I used to, they live two hours away. I used to drive the long way so I could stop at the bathroom every 30 minutes. I didn't ever even make that connection. And because of that, I didn't go visit them. So yeah, the diet's hard. Yeah, it can make you feel isolated. But, uh, but if it makes you a better person in the end, then it's all worth it. And I don't know if that's going to be everyone's experience, but it's been my experience very profoundly. Um, so that's relationships. And then just to wrap up the work thing, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate. All those challenges led me to be a guy who's an entrepreneur. I have a lot of pokers in the fire, um, whether it's stove plans and, and innovating um, fire science uh, stuff, whether it's drawing online or i mean excuse me drawing uh electrical designs i've done at this point electrical engineering on boats for every um function of the public sector i have fire boats all over the country fbi boats army boats corps of engineer boats navy boats um many many police boats many many private fishing boats you know all sporting electrical designs that i drew um and i'm proud of that and and i wouldn't have done that if i could have left the toilet. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's made me be flexible and be creative. Um, and a lot, you know, I've done a lot of other things to make money as well, whether it's selling sides of beef that I've raised or, um, you know, creating uh, websites for friends or 
helping friends design their cabins or, you know, and heating solutions, um, all of those things. So, and I still, I, I stopped taking paying physical work when I got sick, uh, but I've got some coming next week because it, it you know, pays well and, uh, and I'm healthy. So I'm going to go climb around in some metal boats with guys banging on metal boxes. I mean, it's pretty awful to be honest. Um, but I look forward to it in short spurts. Uh, they're welding all around me, you know, I'm covering my eyes and there's dust and I crawl in metal, you know, on metal girders and squeeze crimpers all day. And you know, it's blue collar hard work. Um, but I'm good at it. And, uh, we make beautiful boats and I'm really proud of my work. When I get out of there, I like dressing the wires just so and looking up under the dash and seeing it look like, you know, a spaceship. It's, it's awesome. I love it. So, um, I'm finally well enough to be able to go do that again. And, you know, I'm going to be able to set bend all day in the boat instead of half of it in the bathroom. Uh, I don't have to take long breaks to eat. Um, I'm not starving. Uh, the food, you know, even energy delivery from zero carb is great. I don't eat till lunchtime anyway. So I'll, you know, bring some cooked burgers and eat those at lunch and be able to go all day. So from a work standpoint, zero carb is great. It got me off the toilet. It got me confidence. Um, and I'm able to go back to work and, and be productive. And I've done a few boats in the last few months over the summer. I did some for another friend and, uh, yeah. So, um, that's my work history and that's my relationship history. <laughs> I don't know if that helps you guys at all, but it sure helps me, man. You guys are like my therapists. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to these and, and letting me share. And uh, again, my biggest hope is that someone out there finds this and, and says, man, that's, I can relate. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, it's someone who's at the stage where I was when I couldn't see down the road and know that, uh, that that something inside of me that was keeping me from being a good partner, that something inside of me that said, no, you can't commit yet, you know, that's, you know, that it's not something that is wrong, like foundationally with me, but it's wrong. I'm sick. I was sick. I was ill. And I needed to figure out what that was before I could commit to someone else. So hopefully someone will find this and hear this and be like, boy, I have some things to work on. I don't even know what they are, but I'm going to get started because that's where I was. I didn't consciously recognize even the, even the diarrhea or, you know, I recognized the depression. I knew I was depressed, but I just kind of, you know, figured whatever, I'll exercise it off. And, um, I knew I was moody up and down, but again, I didn't really recognize that that was a function of some kind of imbalance in my, in my body overall. I thought it would be with me for life, um, and that isn't the case. You can heal, and there is hope. And so, yeah, I'm a 48-year-old, uh, short, little, single, weird dude in the in the woods, um, but I still have hope, and uh, and it gets better every day because I'm better every day. And that's really what I focus on nowadays. Is is my work? In my opinion, is is working on myself. Um, working on my health because in health lies happiness and how can I go out and be valuable to other people if I'm ill and that was what I thought I stopped working because I was like well I can keep going to work and keep squeezing these crimpers and my joints were terrible I was inflamed and arthritic because of my diet which I didn't know um, I was like I can keep trying to do this but I'm just going to deteriorate until I can't do it and then I'm not going to be good to anybody or I can you know circle the wagons and find my health and fix myself and hopefully become valuable again. Uh, and so that's why I'm sharing this. I hope that someone hears this and is inspired to, um, you know, rather than just saying, well, I'm so sick. I just got to go plug away every day. You know, we do got to plug away every day, but plug away at yourself as your top priority. Uh, that's my advice. I mean, I know that you know, people have families and responsibilities and people counting on them, but you're not good to them either if you're sick. You know, you cannot pour from an empty pitcher. Uh, it's not my saying. I know you guys have probably all heard that before, but it's, it was very important to me, that one, when I was very ill. Um, so, yeah, there's relationships and there's work. Um, 
you know, because of all that, I still, I don't think I'll ever be financially stable. Um, I'm pretty, um, uh, I'm pretty immune to risk and instability because I've had it my whole life. So I don't worry about not having money in the bank and not knowing what's coming up next month because I've always been resourceful. Um, and that's also a function, I think, of my illness and my history, you know, just not having those opportunities um, to, to have a career with a health plan or 401k or any of those things. But, uh, yeah, I'm still looking, you know, optimistically at the future because I'm better and I'm a better, more valuable to other people. So, okay, I think I said that 12 million times. Clearing up a little out there. So, you know, I think I do want to take you guys walking around and show you what one of my days looks like. And uh, and again, I'm going to keep sharing. They probably won't always be this long. Sorry for the length. Um, but I will keep sharing my progression now as I get back to work. I may not have enough time to do them as often, but I'm, sh I'm sure going to try. Um, I'm going to probably be working for the next few months and uh, try and get myself a leg up and a head start on, on whatever my next phase is. So. As always, you guys, I cannot thank you enough. I feel so blessed. I am so fortunate to have your support and a venue to share my story and to get this out. Um, and, you know, thank you. Honestly, thank you. So, okay. Hit me with the comments and the uh, questions. And that was positive feedback. Boy, it makes me feel so good, you guys. Thanks so much. And uh, I'll see you next time. I got a little spider crawling around over here on my microphone. That's what I keep looking at. Um, I will uh, see you guys next time. And in the meantime, <laughs> take care of yourselves. Take care of the ones you love. And, uh, and let's move forward. Progress. Okay.